Well, welcome everyone. Uh, it is my distinct honor to um, welcome our speaker, uh, Sajad Moazini. And he comes to us from Columbia University. Uh, and before that, he was at uh, UC Berkeley. Uh, he works actually in a very interesting area that uh, combines multiple technologies and integrated circuits and integrated photonics to create larger systems for a variety of applications ranging from communication systems to biomedical systems such as uh, neural interfaces and uh, pet imaging systems. So he'll be talking to us a little bit about that today. I'll just give you a, a brief a synopsis of his background. He's currently a postdoctoral researcher in Ken Shepard's group, um, uh, uh, which is the Bioelectronic Systems Lab at Columbia University. His research interest lies at the intersection of integrated system design pho and photonics with applications in computing, communication, sensing, and imaging and life sciences. Dr. Mozzini received his PhD degree in electrical engineering and computer science from UC Berkeley in 2018, focusing on large-scale, energy-efficient electronic photonic integration. Uh, he received a BS degree in electrical engineering from uh, Sharif University of Technology, Tehran, Iran, in 2013, and he was awarded the UC Berkeley Graduate Division Fellowship in 2014. So please uh, welcome Sir John. Thanks for the kind introduction, Chris. Uh, good morning, everyone. Today I'll talk about the electronic photonic integrated systems and how they can lead us to next generation intelligence. Integrated systems have been transforming our lives in many ways. And very recently, they gave rise to exciting applications such as machine learning and Internet of Things. Now, these applications are generating or demanding more and more data, which in turn require, requires larger and complex models for the processing. And as a result, today this created demand for higher computational power and intelligence more than ever before. Now, there are four major technological changes that needs to be addressed at the integrated system level to address this need and demand. First, we need to enable hyperscale data centers and build next generations of high performance computing or HPC. Then we need to bring higher computational power at the edge, especially for the latency sensitive applications, essentially to enable edge computing. Next, smart devices are becoming more and more autonomous these days, so we need to equip them with more advanced and versatile sensor images. And finally, we need to develop new type of biological tools that helps us to understand complex biological systems such as human brain better so that we can shift our sensing and computing paradigm toward more bio-inspired and efficient approaches. Now, looking back through the history of the integrated system, we realized that the key enabler was always the CMOS technology. In addition to the Moore's law, which of course gives us a larger number of transistors providing higher computational power, researchers always have the tendency to look into these platforms to see how we can leverage their capabilities to unlocking new functionalities and eventually enabling newer applications. For example, around 20 years ago, researchers tried to see how we can just reuse or repurpose metallic material uh, originally used uh, as interconnect layer in these processes to build on-chip inductor elements. And that invention of the first on-chip inductor element led to the single-chip CMOS radio. And today, we have tens of such radios in our smartphones. The same paradigm shift can be seen in other areas. For example, in millimeter waves, by having transmission lines on a chip, we enable automotive radar applications, 5G, and so on. And very recently, we showed that we can also exploit the features of advanced CMOS processes to bring optical and photonic capabilities into these platforms as well. And this can potentially unlock many, many interesting functionalities for applications in computing, communication, light-based communication, sensing and imaging, cell biology, neuroscience, quantum computing, and so on. So the applications in this domain are endless. And I believe by merging advanced electronics and photonics, we can make a new era for system on a chip. Now, in my PhD, I showed how efficiently we can bring and merge electronic and photonic together and use some of these new technology and capabilities to solve some of the major challenges to get to reach the future generations of HPC supercomputers and data centers. This major challenge is the need for ultra high data rate interconnect with high energy costs and area efficiencies. Looking through the hierarchy of interconnect in HPC or data center, you can easily see that there is certainly a demand for ultra high data rates at every different level of these networks, starting from interact or interact communications, where today we need tens of terabits per second bandwidth, 
all the way down to a single compute node like a CPU, GPU, or even AI accelerators demanding terabyte per second memory processor bandwidth. And as a result, we see the shift toward the heterogeneous packaging and integration where we try to bring different technologies together to address this thing. For instance, today we see HPM high, or high bandwidth memories are uh, co-packaged with the GPU CPUs on the interposer to lower the uh, memory latency and provide higher bandwidth. And now if I can make photonic and optical transceivers at these high, rate data, uh, high data rates and at uh, ultra high energy cost and area efficiencies, I can certainly bring this new type of photonic transceivers into these platforms and solve this challenge. Now silicon photonic has been emerged as a viable solution for this demand. Silicon photonic is trying to replace Compound material traditionally used in optical transfers with silicon, and today we see every major foundry has its own silicon photonic process. However, even the state of the art silicon photonic processes are incapable in addressing this need because of their large energy and cost inefficiencies, and they have still very limited applications, for example, in the case of pluggable solution for interact communication. Also, I want to note that since all of these processes are being optimized toward the specific application of optical interconnects, they are not scalable. So they cannot accommodate thousands of photonic devices with tight pitches in their platforms, which is uh, absolutely essential to build sensors and imagers. So as I said, today's silicon photonic transfers are very inefficient. They're running still at 30 picojoule per bit energy efficiency with the cost of $5 per gigabit per second. Now, if you take these two numbers and see how we can reach the next exascale computing node, you can easily see that we need to burn 6.8 megawatt power and, bear, and, and spend $200 million only for optical interconnects in an exascale HPC node. And these numbers are, are actually getting worse and worse considering the fact that memory processing bandwidth requirements for advanced CPU GPUs are exponentially increasing these days. And these numbers are absolutely out of the energy and cost budget. Now to see where does these inefficiencies are coming from, we should notice that the integration platform, which merges and brings in the electronic and photonic together, sets the limit for the efficiency and performance of the system. There are two known approaches to do so. Uh, in the first approach, which we call it monolithic, we build our electronic and photonic devices monolithically on the same chip. In doing so, we have the closest proximity of electronic and photonic devices. We can have potentially large number of uh, photonic elements because of the high density of interconnects on a chip. It's a single chip solution, so it's low cost. However, all the demonstrations done in this domain ended up using old CMOS processes, and that eventually killed the performance and efficiency of the system at the end. Now, on the other hand, you can go with the 3D or hybrid solution, where now you have the ability to choose and optimize your electronic and photonic platform independently. But there are many disadvantages in doing so as well. First, you have this large parasitic interconnection between the photonic and CMOS chips, uh, which dramatically degrades the performance and efficiency of the system again. You cannot have as many as photonic elements that you want because of the limitations on the number of interconnects between these two platforms. Uh, the cost is absolutely higher since now you have to fabricate two separate chips and pay for the cost of integration. However, now you can go with advanced CMOS on your electronic side. Now in order to bring the best of these two solutions together, I propose to use monolithic photonics in advanced CMOS processes. This is presumably very challenging because advanced transistors and processes are sensitive to the process, op, uh, process changes required for optimizing the photonics. But in this talk, I will describe and explain two solutions for this challenge. In the first approach and method, which we call it zero change, I will take a pure original unmodified CMOS technology node and platform, and I will show you that I can make all the necessary active and passive photonic elements in that platform without changing the process. And also I will show you how by co-optimizing electronic and photonic and exploiting the features of these processes, I can achieve very high performances at the system level. And at the end, I will briefly describe how we can still come up with the ideas to decouple the formation of electronic and photonic so that we can still optimize both of them independently even in a monolithic environment. And this solution essentially unlocks having such photonic monolithic photonic capabilities into the state of the RC mass nodes of let's say sub 10 nanometer. Now let's first see what do I mean by an advanced CMOS node. The performance of a CMOS technology is mainly defined by the FT of the process. FT is, a, is the frequency at which the current gain of a single transistor device drops to one. And it turns out this factor FT 
directly affects speed, energy efficiency, sensitivity, and all sort of performance metrics of optical transceivers. Now here, I'm showing you FT for different technology nodes. And if you notice, FT hasn't been improved since around 32 nanometer technology. This is mainly because of the high focus of the scaling down trend on, optimizing, uh, on increasing and optimizing the density of the transistors and improving the energy efficiency of the electronics and compromising that with the speed of a single transistor device. So around 32 nanometer, 4 or 5 nanometer nodes, we're getting fastest electronics. And if you want to go further for higher density of the electronics and better energy efficiency on the electronics, you can use sub 10 or 20 nanometer nodes. Now, next, let's see how can I bring optical and photonic capabilities in any CMOS platform. The first step for having optical capabilities in any technology is to build the most fundamental optical device, which is a low optical loss waveguide. So here I'm showing you a very simple picture for an optical waveguide. We need to have low optical loss material with high refractive index as a core, like silicon. And we need to have low refractive index material as a cladding to confine the light efficiently inside the core. A good, cladding, a good candidate for cladding in a CMOS process can be silicon dioxide. Now here I'm showing you four major technology platforms that we're using today to build our electronics and transistors. And let's see in which of these processes I can find a sandwich structure like this naturally without any change so that I can potentially have photonic capabilities using the zero change approach in that platform. And in which processes I need to change the material, I need to change the process, add new materials to build such a structure. All CMOS nodes are using box CMOS processes and we build transistors directly in fully <laughs> silicon substrates. Then more advanced CMOS nodes are tier 2 nanometer, 4 to 5 nanometer nodes are using silicon and insulated wafers or SOI and we build transistors in this crystalline silicon region known as the body of the transistor. And for the state of the art CMOS, again we are back to the box CMOS uh, wafers, however we form our transistors in 3D structures called FinFETs. Now if you look into all these four platforms, I can potentially use body of the transistor as the core of the waveguide and use waveguide in this region. However, the thickness of the, uh, the body in the FDSOI platform is not thick enough to provide efficient light confinement. So the only platform that I can use uh, to build photonics without any change is the FDSOI node. And for having such capabilities in any other technology platforms, I need to change the process. So as I said, I will first show you how I can make the photonic uh, uh, systems in 32 nanometer and 45 nanometer technology nodes where I have the luxury of using fastest transistors and CMOS technologies. And at the end, I will show you that how I managed to minimally change the box CMOS process and uh, show the photonic SOC in a 12 inch wafer commercial box CMOS platform for the first time. So starting from the zero change process, I'm using IBM or Global Foundry SOI CMOS technologies. These are 12 inch wafer commercial platforms. Uh, they can publicly access through multi-project wafer programs. And as I said, since they have very fast electronics and transistors, they've been using fabrication and design of high performance proce uh, processors for gaming consoles, personal computers and servers. Starting from the 45 nanometer node, this is the cross section of the 45 nanometer SOI CMOS process. The key enabler for having photonic capabilities in this platform is this sub-100 nanometer T crystalline silicon layer region, originally used as the body of the transistor. So I'm going to use that to build waveguides, great in couplers, and using other features of the process like polysilicon, silicon germanium available, doping implants, you will see later on through this slide that I can make all the necessary active and passive photonic elements as well. So essentially I'm getting all these photonic capabilities for free since there is no change or modification to the process. Again, I'm getting the closest proximity of electronics and photonics in this approach, in this platform. And I only need to perform a single post-processing step to unlock this capability in here. And that is to remove or etch away the silicon substrate underneath the photonic region. This needs to be done because the thickness of the buried oxide, which is about 200 nanometer, is not thick enough to prevent optical light leakage from core of the waveguide to the substrate. So we recently used this technology and showed the microprocessor that can communicate to the memory side through the light. Here you see the die photo for the chip. It has a dual core S5 microprocessor, one megabyte memory cache, and multi-wavelength optical IOs for communication to the memory. Overall, the chip has millions of transistors, hundreds of photonic devices. On the bottom, you see the critical sub-blocks of an optical system or an optical link we, uh, we demonstrated in this work. 
So we have diffraction grating couplers, which brings in and out the light from the fiber to the chip. We use silicon germanium for photo detection. And thanks to the advanced lithography capabilities of these processes, we managed to build high quality factor resonators and ring resonators and use them as modulator resonant photo detectors and filters and so on. Notice because of the high level of the complexity and integration in these platforms, uh, we are avoiding using inefficient pocket devices like Mark Sanders. Now putting together many of these devices along with fast electronics, you can perform more interesting electronic photonic functionalities. As I said, here we had uh, multi-wavelength optical IOs running at moderate data rates of five gigabit per second. This is the agenda for the rest of the talk. Through this talk, I will show you how important it is to have a good understanding and insight on devices, process and integration, and system and circuit in order to design high performance electronic photonic integrated system. So first, I will show you how in order to push the performance limits of such optical links, I made a behavioral model for this critical device, the micro modulator, see what are the challenges at ultra high data rates, and overcome them by co-optimizing electronic and photonic. Then in the second part, I will show you how I extend the zero change approach to more advanced CMOS node at 32 nanometer. And in doing so, I managed to open up the new degrees of freedom and device design by exploiting the features of that platform as well. At the end, I will show you how I minimally change the box CMOS process and manage to show and demonstrate a photonic SOC in that platform. So starting from the electronic photonic co-optimization, as I said, micro ring modulators are the most critical devices in, in our optical links. And first, we need to learn about them. A micro ring modulator is a closed loop waveguide coupled to a bus waveguide, and also there can be a drop port at the other end. And whenever the circumference of this ring is an integer multiple of the input light wavelength, the light will be trapped inside this cavity, and we say the ring is on resonance. And whenever it is not, the light can just pass it through, and we are at off resonance state. Now, this behavior reflects as periodic notches in the wavelength domain with limited optical line width or bandwidth available around each resonance uh, with the Lorentzian characteristic. Now notice the resonance wavelength is linearly proportional to refractive index. I can define quality factor for this cavity as the ratio of the resonance wavelength or the line width. These are very compact devices with the radius of only five micron, which makes them ultra energy and area efficient uh, photonic elements that can be used as a modulator, filter, and et cetera. Also, there is another great advantage with, with this structure, which immediately enables multi-wavelength operation. If I, for example, cascade a bunch of these rings with slightly different radiuses over the same shared bus waveguide, I can simultaneously communicate the data over multiple optical carrier wavelengths. And this capability is called uh, through the same fiber or same waveguide. And this capability is called wavelength division multiplexing, or WDM. Now let's see how I can use this structure to build an optical link. If I add PN junctions in these cavities by applying different voltages over the junctions, I can deplete or inject the carriers inside the ring. Then based on the carrier plasma effect, the change in, in, in the density of the free carrier causes the change in the refractive index, which eventually shifts the resonance of the ring. Now if I have a laser at the input of the modulator at wavelength lambda zero, and let's say I'm switching between these two resonance states, each one corresponding to the data bit I'm going to transmit over the channel, I can essentially perform on-off key modulation in the frequency domain by creating two different optical intensity levels at the output of the modulator. The distance between these two optical intensity levels is called optical modulation amplitude, or OMA. Now similarly, on the receiver side, I can use this structure as a filter and using a photo detector, convert this optical intensity levels back to the digital domain. I can do that as long as I meet the minimum OMA requirement of the receiver, which is set by the sensitivity of the electronics on the receiver side. Now, in order to, uh, to see how can I push the performance limits of such optical links, I made a behavioral model for this device ca that captures all the rele relevant behaviors, including electrical behavior caused by the PN junctions, optical behavior, the Lorentzian characteristic, and thermal behavior. And now using this behavioral model at the system level simulation, I can see what are the challenges for higher data rates. The first one is the limited modulation bandwidth, and the second is the thermal sensitivity of the ring that I'm gonna talk about today. But through this simulation, you can study other type of non-ideality such as non-linearity as well. So the first challenge is the limited modulation bandwidth and the trade-off that exists between the optical bandwidth of the ring and the OMA. 
As I mentioned earlier, since there is a limited optical bandwidth available around each resonance, as we want to move to our higher data rates, we need to increase this bandwidth, and that degrades the ohming. Here you see the effect that as I move toward the higher bandwidth rings, the shape of the Lorentzian becomes broader, the slopes on the sides are smaller, and assuming a, a fixed capability to shift the resonance of the ring, the optical intensity levels created at the output of the modulator are closer to each other, meaning that the OMA is now degraded, and now I need to pay the extra energy penalty over the laser side or transmitter to recover this degraded OMA so that I can still meet the minimum OMA requirement of the receiver to transmit the data. Here you see the same effect in the simulation, that as we increase the optical bandwidth, OMA drops, and one way to boost it up is to apply higher voltage over the junctions, which comes with its own energy inefficiency at the transmit side. There's also another source for the bandwidth limitations caused by the limited RC time constant of the PN junctions. So in this work, overall, I'm using higher order modulation to increase the spectral efficiency. I'm using PAM4 modulation, essentially doubling the data rate within the same bandwidth by transmitting two data bits per symbol as opposed to a single bit transmission per symbol in the, NRZ, in the conventional NRZ case. However, you can argue that, first of all, you have four levels. So the adjacent levels are closer to each other than the, the total OMA. So you may need to consider the energy penalty on the laser side to spread out these levels so that you can still differentiate them and take them with the same receiver sensitivity. And on top of that, the receiver is going to be more complex because it needs to detect four levels. So you need to have more samplers, bear more energy. But through this simulation and modeling, I can see how the overall energy efficiency of a link is changing by switching from NRZ to PAM4 modulation for every different link data rate. So here I'm showing you the benefits we are getting in terms of the OMA by switching from NRZ to PAM4 at every different link data rate, assuming two different drive capabilities. So first, I can consider the fact that the, in worst case scenario, for the penalty of the optical, uh, and the optical source to, spread, uh, to increase that and spread out these levels, and on top of that, the worst case energy penalty on the receiver side, and still, you see that at certain data rates, even in terms of the energy efficiency of the whole link, it is beneficial to switch from NRZ to PAM4. And the question is that, how can I generate this multi-level optical intensity levels efficiently at the output of my modulator? And to answer that, I will first show how we build our microring modulators in this, in this process. Here is a 3D rendering layout of a microring modulator in 45 nanometers, so I know. We are using the source ring doping implants to activate these cavities. Uh, we have internally planar, ju uh, planar junctions, like the ring, and I have also an embedded heater structure, resistive heater structure, built in the same crystal silicon region inside the ring, and you will see later on how can I exploit that to overcome the thermal sensitivity challenge and issue of the ring, solve that. So here my idea is that since I have this segmented structure, I can drive each segment independently, meaning that by depleting just a certain uh, number of the segments, I can control the amount of resonance shift and eventually digitize the optical intensity of the light at the output of the modulator. I call this device an optical digital to analog converter, or ODAC, which, uh, since it can essentially translate the digital data directly to the optical domain. For instance, in the current design, I have 64P and 64N junctions, enabling me to create up to 64 in uh, different optical intensity levels at the output of my modulator, which is equivalent to a six-bit binary optical DAC. Quick question. Yes. Um, I know it's very early for these type of devices, but do you take considerations of like process and temperature variation and how that affects the different levels as they come out? Yeah, and I will actually talk about that. That's the second challenge, ten more sensitive. Thanks for asking. So. Here, I, through this simulation and modeling, I can see what are the benefits of using optical DAC versus the conventional way of having an electrical DAC driving a microring modulator. First of all, this shows much higher linearity. Then, uh, by using this optical DAC structure, a new device, I completely eliminate the need for having high-speed custom analog circuit uh, electrical DAC that comes with its own area and energy overhead. And also, I can use this device to perform more complex optical functionalities. For example, I can use it to perform coherent or higher order modulations like COM16. I can use it as an equalizer for higher data rates. Or even I can use it as a pulse shaper for other photonic applications. For example, to build arbitrary waveform generators. Now, moving on to the second challenge, which is the thermal sensitivity of the ring. 
It tears out any temperature variations on the chip that can be caused by the circuit, optical power inside the ring, or et cetera. Also shifts the resonance, affects the resonance of the ring, and it can degrade the OMA as well. So here you see this effect that let's say at temperature T0, uh, the resonance of the rings are placed at this optimal location in regard to laser wavelength where the OMA is maximized. Now, if the temperature goes up, it causes the red shift, shifting up the resonance. And now at this new temperature, I'm modulating between these two solid lines instead of the dashed lines. And you can clearly see that the, OMA, the transmit I is a smaller, OMA is degraded. And if the temperature goes up even more, that can be easily the case that essentially this uh, transmit eye collapses and you're not transmitting any data anymore. So we need to have an active thermal tuning mechanism that finds this optimal location for the resonance of the ring and locks it there regardless of any thermal variations. This is, a, this is a block diagram of the thermal tuning mechanism I designed for my Panford transmitter. Through this loop, I can first sweep the resonance of the ring, find that optimal location, and locks it there uh, regardless of any thermal variations by essentially uh, adjusting the strength of the embedded ether structure I showed you earlier in my slides. So very briefly, the way it works as follows. We first uh, sense a, a very small portion of the optical power inside the cavity, let's say 1% through this drop port. Then I convert it back to the electrical domain using a detector. Next, by integrating over this photocurrent for two consecutive transmission windows and knowing the statistics of the PAMFOR symbols I'm transmitting over the channel, I can estimate what are the optical intensity levels corresponding to each of these four levels and the separations. And then using a, a digital controller, I can adjust the strength of the embedded ether structure to contract with these thermal perturbations happening to the ring and make sure the resonance is gonna be locked in that optimal location. Finally, this is the full power for transmitter block diagram. On top, you see the sub-blocks of the thermal tuner, which I just explained in the previous slide. Uh, I also designed a 20 gigahertz LC digital PLL as a reference clock source, and I'm, I'm feeding the divided clocks to the data path. And these are the sub-blocks of the data path. And notice that all the blocks from the time symbols are generated, serialized, encoded, and drivers are all done in the digital domain by using this optical DAC device. These are the micrographs of this uh, test chip for this work. I have a three by three millimeter test chip. You're looking from backside of the chip after the silicon substrate is completely removed. Uh, we have some pure photonic tested structures and electronic photonic systems. You see a variety of pamphlet uh, transmitters on the bottom left side of this chip. Each comes with a different flavor of optical DAC. This is a shared uh, PLL clock source between all these PAMFOR transmitters. And this is a zoom in into one complete PAMFOR transmitter. You see all the necessary analog front end circuitry of the thermal tuner and digital controller and circuits are fit in this compact area of 150 micron by 200 micron. And I have all the necessary photonic elements monolithically on this chip sitting right next to the circuits. So I have vertical coupler which brings in the laser light from the fiber to the chip then I modulate this light through this optical DAC device. This is zooming, as I said, in the, into this device. As I say, it's very compact with a diameter of only 10 micron. And then the modulated light is coupled out of the chips by second grating coupler for monitoring and testing. Now here you see the results that now I can operate at high data rates of 40 gigabit per second PAM4 and 20 gigabit per second NRC and achieve the record energy efficiency and bandwidth density of 4 to 5 to joule per bit and 3.6 terabit per second per millimeter square. And now these numbers are making this approach very suitable and attractive for co-integrating this type of photonic transmitters with high performance SOCs. I also perform a thermal stress test to evaluate the performance and functionality of, the, of my thermal tuning loop. So here, by turning on and off the different PAM4 transmitters around the main transmitter under the test, I can create a thermal stress pattern for that transmitter. You see, when there is no thermal stress or perturbation uh, applied to the transmitter, we can clearly see four different levels and the data is being transmitted. However, if you turn on these thermal aggressors on a chip, uh, the resonance will be immediately shifted and the transmit eye collapses and basically you cannot even differentiate the levels anymore. However, if you have the thermal tuning on, uh, the quality of the eye remains unchanged 
And that is because of the fact that now that embedded ether structure is contracting with these uh, perturb uh, in, uh, with these thermal stress perturbations happening to the ring, and you can see that through the correlation between the strength of the heater, which is set through the thermal training loop by the applied stress to the to a transmitter. Do, do you have any idea how much temperature variation you're getting by turning these different uh, modulators on around the main transmitter? So that's a good question. Here I'm changing about five degrees C. But in this how do you, test, how do you know that. I'm just curious. Oh, it's because I know that the DAC is essentially running at uh, it's capable of it's nine bits and it's capable of tuning for about 50 degrees C. And we know the sensitivity of the ring is about 10, 10 gigahertz shift per Kelvin. This is the, break, the total transmitter break, uh, energy and area breakdown, assuming a dedicated PLL crux source per transmitter. <laughs> The complete transmitter is taking 0.06 millimeter area, and notice that only 16% of the area is taken by the photonics. And this number can be even shrink down to below 10% by optimizing the floor plan. Now similarly on the energy side, where I need to spend 700 femtojoules per bit, about 60 femtojoules per bit is only taken by the photonics. And now let's see how using this new device and this new platform, I improve the energy efficiency of today's silicon photonic transceivers. So first of all, by moving from a 3D and hybrid platform to monolithic, now I significantly reduce down the interconnect, uh, the parasitic interconnect between the devices, uh, between the photonic devices and electronics, and that helps me to improve the sensitivity of my photonic uh, receiver, and also make it more energy efficient. Then on top of that, using this new optical DAC device and co-optimization methods versus the conventional modula modulation approaches. I improved the efficiency of, the energy efficiency of trans, uh, the photonic transmitter by more than 10x. And finally, since I achieved this ultra high data, uh, bandwidth, uh, bandwidth densities of terabit per second per millimeter square, now this tiny transceiver chip can sit very closely to the CPU GPUs on the same interposer platform, meaning that the electrical link connecting this electro-optical bridge chip to the proce processing element like a CPU or GPU is now only on the range of millimeters, which helps me a lot to save the energy on, of the electrical interconnect and link between these two chips. So overall, I'm improving the energy efficiency of the whole photonic transceiver by about 7.5x. Now moving to the second part here, I, moved, I extend the zero change approach to a more advanced CMOS node of 32 nanometer from 45. So by moving from 45 to 32 nanometer, I improve the performance of electron and speed of electronics by about 30%. And 32 nanometer is a more complex node. It's in fact the first CMOS technology nodes with, uh, that comes with the metal gate high-k materials. And you will see in the next slide that it has some nice extra features that I'm gonna uh, show you that I can exploit them to improve the performance of the photonic devices even in this, uh, by moving to, to this new node. Overall, these four features uh, fastest electronics ever monolithically integrated with the photonic elements. So all those CMOS, CMOS platforms seem to be very constrained environments. If you look carefully into details of these processes, you can always find the features that can be exploited to your advantage to open up the new degrees of freedom in device design and improve the performance of the photonics and eventually the whole system. Here is one example in this work. This is a, the 3D rendering layout of a resonant photo detector by embedding a ring of silicon germanium available in these processes inside the ring, we, uh, we use this ring both as an optical filter plus photo detector. However, in the 45 nanometer node, we had to use embedded silicon germanium originally used as a, as a source ring of PMOS devices. And it had the poor germanium concentration of below 19%. By moving to this new node, I realized that there is a new silicon germanium material available. And by studying model and modeling that, I realized that the germanium concentration is now much higher at the levels of 40%. Then I redesigned this device using this new material, and I managed to show that I can improve the, uh, the performance of our, photo, our resonant photodetectors, both in terms of the quantum efficiency and the electro-optical bandwidth by better than 2x. So now in the zero change approach, we have uh, photodetectors with bandwidths of better than, much better than 12 and a half gigahertz. These are the micrographs for this work. 
You see that I managed to show, again, passive and active photonic elements in this platform as well. And I also built the analog front end of the transmitter and receiver uh, in this work to be able to characterize many variants of photonic devices in situ and show the full electronic photonic capability together. This is the, blo uh, this is the block diagram for the analog front end of the transmitter, so the differential front end of the receiver, and the results where I can now operate, transmit, and receive the data at data rates of better than 12 gigabits per second. And data rate in this work is limited since there is no high speed clock source on the chip. Now moving to the last part. Majority of the high performance electronics today are still built in the BoxyMOS processes because of the high density of the, of the transistors and higher energy efficiency of the electronic. So all the advanced CPU, GPUs, fast network switches, and dense memories are using BoxyMOS processes in particular FinFET technologies. And as I mentioned at the beginning of my talk, if you want to bring photonic capabilities monolithically into these platforms, we need to change the process. So here I showed for the first time that uh, we can have monolithic photonic processes in a 12 inch, in a 12 inch wafer, BoxyMOS commercial process by only adding five new mass set to this technology. And again, this is the only way I, of having these uh, monolithic photonic capabilities into the state of the RCMOS nodes. But first, you should know that the wafer level process development required many considerations at every different stage of the development, starting from the design. Since now I'm adding new mask sets and layers to the process, I need to have my own CAD infrastructure. So here I made the process design kit that can be used for modeling, simulation, and even check the conformity of our designs with the manufacturing rules. And I had also to make the test structure to be able to characterize photonics and electronics separately. And also, make a, and also I made a photonic associate that I will talk about it later to show the true per per performance and high capabilities of electronic photonic integration in this platform. Then at the fabrication stage, where we collaborated with the College of Nanoscience and Engineering, first we need to collaborate and coordinate with the fab in order to break the whole development cycle into multiple runs. For instance, here we had three runs. The first run was only with the photonic devices. The second was photonic and electronic, mostly for the purpose of uh, characterization. And the last round was filled with all sort of interesting and advanced electronic photonic systems like photonic ADCs, WDM, high-speed coherent rings, and so on. Also, each run needs to split it into multiple variants so that we can try different doping levels, thicknesses, and so on to be able to optimize our uh, fabrication recipe and flow through each run and, each uh, and the whole development cycle. And finally, I then once the wafers are fabricated, we need to, uh, we need to test them. So I made a test setups and structures to be able to extract the properties, the electro-optical properties separately and together, both at the wafer level and chip level. And finally, see what is the performance of the whole platform. So here we, we use the 65 nanometer box mass process. And you can see the cross-section of this technology after adding these five new masks to this technology, to the, pro to the process. If you recall from the beginning of my talk, there are two main issues preventing us from having photonic capabilities in a BoxyMOS platform without any change at the very beginning. First of all, there was no low optical loss material to use as a core of the waveguide. To solve that, we deposited a low optical loss polysilicon, and through annealing and planarizing that, we showed that we can use that as an efficient core material. Also, there was no medium to confine the light in, as a, to, to use as a cladding to confine the light efficiently inside this core. And to solve that, we also added thick silicon dioxide photonic trenches underneath the photonic region as an under cladding. And now we can make low optical loss waveguides. On top of that, we added the partial H step to form rigid structures and build grating couplers and two more mask sets for the P and N doping implants for active devices. And finally, you can see the SEM of this. Uh, some of the devices in this, in this work. We have passive elements like grating couplers, active photonic devices like microimmodulators sitting right next to the circuits. On the circuit side, we have both custom analog circuits and fully digital sub-blocks. And I want to note that all these digital blocks are done using the conventional VLSI flows, uh, using the original 65 nanometer technology, not the standard cell libraries without any change. Now, in order to show the high performance of electronic photonic integration in this platform, 
I made a photonic SOC uh, using this in, these infrastructures. However, since now I'm adding this new layer, the mask to the process, there are some, again, new consideration that needs to be taken into account by co-designing electronic and photonic. For instance, on the circuit side, I had to use more advanced circuits like building high, high swing drivers to overcome the limitations over the shift capability of the ring. And the devices, we have some ideas to combine the drop port of the detector, for example, with the modulator to boost up the quality factor. And even at the floor planning and design, I need to be very careful with the proximity and meeting the density requirements of these new layers and make sure they're compatible with the original layers of this process. Now, finally, you can see the photos of the first one with electronic and photonic, a 12-inch wafer fabricated at CNSE. Each wafer comes with about 70 reticles. Here you can see a wirebound package of one of my photonic SOCs. This is the die photo for the chip. It can support up to four independent transmitter and receiver WDM optical links. I, I intentionally designed it in this modular fashion to be able to characterize many, many variants of photonic elements in situ. Overall, the chip has about 32 million transistors and 200 photonic elements. You can see the zoom in into one of the one, one transceiver slides where I designed all the necessary analog circuits of the transmitter, receiver, and clocking blocks. And we have also all the digital circuits, controllers, and so on in this region. And these are the zoom-ins into critical sub-blocks of optical systems here. So first, I characterized photonic devices, and then also I embedded this uh, ring oscillator structure with the counter in each of these slices to be able to probe the per how, how the performance of electronics are changing after we modify this technology and what are the variations. Overall, we achieve quality factors of better than 5K, a bandwidth of better than 10 gigahertz, and responsiveness of better than 10%. And after testing these, these uh, ring oscillator structures, we concluded that the performance of electronics remains unchanged after we modify this process, and there's no significant inter-die or inter-die variations. This is the block diagram for the transmitter and the receiver, and you can see the electro-optical results where now it can transmit the data uh, with data rate of 10 gigabit per second per channel and detect it and receive it on the receiver side with the bit array of better than 10 to minus 10. This is the summary of all the demonstrations in this presentation. So first I showed you how by co-optimizing electronic and photonic, I achieved world record energy efficiency and bandwidth density of optical transmitters in a zero change process. Then I showed you how I extend the zero change approach to more advanced CMOS node of 32 nanometer. And finally, I showed you how I managed to change a box CMOS process for the first time minimally, and show that I can have photonic, SOC, uh, photonic SOCs in a box CMOS platform. Now recently, I'm developing such electronic photonic integrated systems for the application in neuroscience. Today, there is a great need and demand for optical uh, methods for the neuroscience community with the advent of optogenetics, new imaging, and tomography schemes. And if we can reuse this existing CMOS infrastructure for these devices, we can, make them, uh, we can significantly improve the performance, efficiency of these devices. We can make them wireless, combine multimodalities, and so on. So there are many advantages for developing such electronic photonic integrated system for the neuroscience community. Now, hopefully, in this talk, I showed you how important it is to have a good understanding and insight on devices, circuit and, circuit and systems, and the process and integration in order to design electron, electronic photonic integrated systems. And based on my experience in these areas, I'm excited to develop the next generations of such integrated systems for applications from computing, communication, sensing and imaging, life sciences, and quantum computing. Now, moving forward, I'm interested to leverage CMOS technologies by adding new, newer optical capabilities and also integrating other type of emerging devices as well. Of course, I need to develop my own CAD infrastructures, models, and very packaging schemes for applications beyond the interconnects. And I'm gonna use these new platforms and capabilities for these applications. <coughs> Here are some of uh, my future project plans. So on the computing side, I'm interested to work on the new type of emerging optical switching networks that can drastically improve the compute time of computationally intensive applications for the servers and supercomputers. Also, I want to work on the robustness and our energy efficiency and data rate of the future generations of optical links as well. On the communication side, I'm excited to build the free space optical communication links to provide tens of gigabit per second wireless bandwidth for applications such as VR. And also, 
see how can we use RF photonic techniques to indirectly facilitate the millimeter wave band solutions for these applications. One famous example that I want to work on uh, on sensor side is the LiDAR system. Today, LiDAR systems are still super expensive, bulky, and mechanical. And now that I have these platforms where I can have thousands of photonic elements with very tight pitches, I can, uh, I can uh, using techniques like phaser is I can significantly improve the efficiency and performance of these, de uh, these devices. Also notice having advanced electronics right at the sensor node enables me to perform all sorts of interesting data processing, uh, encryption and transfer uh, in these single chip solutions. And it can be used for other type of sensing as well. And finally, for the life science applications, I'm planning to use this ultra sensitive photonic elements to build label free molecular sensors and also develop such electronic photonic integrated platforms that can operate at the near infrared and visible light ranges. And the, uh, that has a bunch of applications in cell biology and neuroscience. For, for example, you can use them for fluorescence immunase, DNA genome sequencing, you can use them to build new type of neural implants, and so on. And finally, I want to thank and acknowledge my advisors, collaborators, and funding agencies. Thank you. All right, thank you. Uh, it's open for questions. Mo. Uh, yeah, so you showed uh, seven, a factor of 7.5 reduction in the energy consumption moving from conventional uh, optical uh, interconnect to the uh, zero change yeah. CMOS concept. And how is that uh, the energy consumption compared to just purely electrical interconnect? And uh, what's your view of the, the perspective of bringing optical interconnect on the chip? As Comparing purely electrical. I mean, the electrical is doing pretty well nowadays, mm -hmm. right? Yeah, that, that's a very good question, actually. Previously, because the energy efficiency of these links, optical links are about 30 picojoule, they are much higher than the energy efficiency of, they're worse than the energy efficiency of the electronics. Right now, I can tell you that the short reach links on the, on the board, just to connect this processing element to the edge of the car, is going to be about 10 picojoule per bit. So people are trying, uh, we're trying to avoid optical link. But now that I can achieve four picojoule per bit, it can be used all the way even for the onboard communication. Are you talking about on chip, right? On chip, uh, right now, you, you need to improve this. A CPU between a memory CPU or between two CPUs? I'm talking about multiple chips on the board, yeah. That's between the chips. Yes. For the on chip communication, it's still electrical links are about 100 femtojoules per bit. So you need an order of yeah, an order of magnitude improvement over this energy efficiency to get to the on-chip communication for the optics. But right now, there is still a lot of room for bringing optical interconnect closer and closer to the processors. Because four picojoule per bit is pretty much even better than this short-reach electrical links that they're using today on the PCB traces. Yes. Yeah. yeah, so, so you mentioned more high, you know, higher order modulation like quant. Yeah. So with the method that you have by tuning the resonance, you can only seem to get, you know, PAM. So how are you going to get QAM with the same method? Oh, so that's a good question. So right now I'm using PAM because I am tuning, right now this optical deck is, it has six bits. But I'm just using it to create four different levels. But I can create up to 64 different levels with the same device. I'm just not I using if that. I rephrase the question. You're, you're asking. You can get amplitude modulation, but oh, how, is that how, the, how can I go and extend this to get phase modulation? So I can oh, get both. Okay, I'm sorry, I didn't get that. Actually, we are changing the phase, uh, phase using the same device as well. But since all of this, uh, the, the work I currently showed you are basically on the direct detection amplitude modulation, I just didn't show the phase change. But the, the, each Lorenzian characteristic also changes the, sh uh, changes the phase by 2 pi. So essentially combining multiple of these rings and these optical decks, you can create different levels in the phase as well. And amplitude, yeah. Uh, I think there's a que question from Richard and then uh, Arka after. So how does the, this uh, integration affect the reliability of the year of the chip here? Reliability. Yeah. What I mean in terms of the... Right? So I, this, I think I'm also decreases the 
Yeah, he's just asking, so as you bring on these photonic devices, how does that impact the yield of Oh, that's of, a good question. Device? So in the first platforms I showed you, we're not changing the process. So the yield, everything is just sim pure like CMOS technology. And that's like one of the advantages in here. For instance, if you use custom photonic processes, you see a lot of variations happening from each round that you get these chips. Here it's like very small. But did but you say that there was one of those yeah, the last you, one, you modified the, the process? Yeah, exactly. You some additional that's good. steps. That's the last one, actually, we had these ring oscillators to show how the performance is changing and how you, the yield is changing. The, our conclusion was that the performance is not changing by, cha uh, by testing these structures. There, are, there were some yield issues, but you should keep in mind this is not a commercial process. That was like the first step for developing these platforms. So overall, and we know where those, those problems are coming from, like for instance, we didn't really pay attention to the density of one of the layers. That causes the CMP issues. But if we fix that, I would say it will be like, at this, at, like in par with the CMOS technologies. Thank you. Uh, Arka. Yeah. So I mean, it seems like I mean, for ultimately for the future application, you need reduced power and more to it, get to probably make new devices and optical devices. So ring is pretty simple like, in terms of device like fabrication. But if you do like some more complicated, how do you think this method is going to kind of work? Do you think it can still do like, let's say, photonic crystal cavity? Can we like fabricate using this kind of uh, methodology? When you say this method, you mean and integrating in CMOS? Yeah, okay. Oh, the zero changer. Okay, that's that's a very good question. Actually, so there are two things. One is in terms of the dev the new devices you want to make with the new materials. Yeah, that's the zero changer approach. You have the limitations. Whatever it is. So it. it well, if you want to make it with the same materials available in this process, then actually this is a very good candidate because you get very high precision in terms of the lithography. You have very high precision masks here, and you can pretty much make all the devices if you don't want to change the stack or like the material. So we have actually, we have some demonstrations of, of photonic crystals in this platform as well. I can talk about this later. And Thank you. I think there's one more question from Mo. Uh, yeah, so yes. one thing I didn't get is you show that the laser power reduced from eight picojoule per bit oh, to yes. one picojoule. So how did your new modulator achieve that? So that so that, that's a very good question. That was the estimate on the receiver sensitivity if you mo if you built it in a monolithic platform. So it turns out that the capacity the capacitive of uh, the capacitance or parasitics of the photodetector connect connected to its circuits directly impacts the sensitivity of your receiver electronics. Like in terms of the, how much dBm power you need on the laser side to detect these levels. And I was estimating that since I'm moving from like wire bound or 3D, bound, 3D integration approaches to monolithic, then how am I improving that? And then based on that, I was like, we're improving about Torx. Yes, yes, yes. That, that was just the fact that we are moving to the monolithic platform, so the parasitics are smaller. So I estimated how much I'm improving the energy efficiency of the laser, yes. So it looks like uh, both Mo and uh, Summit ate their Wheaties this morning, so I think Summit has one more question. Yeah. <laughs> so let me, let me reformulate Mo's question from a communication systems perspective. So suppose you go to 16 quam or 64 quam, and you want to keep that, you know, pico joules per bit lower than whatever it is that you want, right? So you have to pay a penalty either on the transmit side, or you have to pay a penalty by improving the receiver sensitivity. Right. That's what you okay. So, which way does it go? How do you share the overall? Do you need to send more? You know, typically as a transmitter, you either need to send more power, or for the yes. same power, I need to improve the receiver sensitivity. So, from your design perspective, which way do you go if I want to keep the power budget lower than? So, the work here I showed you was uh, the method I, uh, I was talking about. The optical DAC was basically only for the transmitter. But that's a good question to see how, how, where is like the sweetest spot for designing both the rice receiver and transmitter. And I would say that you need to like co-optimize both of them together at the end, depending on what is the data rate and what are the bandwidth limitations. For example, here, like we have bandwidth limitations, as I said, both on the modulator side and the photodetector has bandwidth limitation. So you want to see how much equalization you want to do, for example, on the receiver side and then find that uh, the spot. It, it depends on the modulation, for instance. Okay, good. Any more questions? All right, let's thank our speaker one more time. Thank you.